Good afternoon. Okay. I thought there was going to be someone official to introduce us, but uh, I'm happy to, to take up that honor. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Doug. Um, hi, guys. It is such a joy to be here today uh, talking about one of my favorite subjects, uh, or maybe my most favorite subject at the time, because it's such a timely uh, movement that is underway in this country. Um, I am Armanis. I am currently the CEO of Pioneer Works, which is a really interesting interdisciplinary cultural center in Red Hook, Brooklyn, um, and uh, was founded by an artist, Dustin Yellen. And um, it's a wonderful place of discovery for those of you who haven't been. Uh, I'm new to the job. Uh, I spent the last seven years before this as the Arts Commissioner for New York State. And actually, it was that experience which led me to this place of joy about this work. Um, so most, I would say the my entire professional career has been in the arts in some way. And when you're in the arts, everyone talks about the arts as no one questions the value of the arts, right? They say, oh, it's amazing. And everyone, we're kind of in an echo chamber of sorts, right? So then I end up in Albany, uh, the capital of New York, for those of you who don't know. And, uh, and uh, people say, and I say I'm head of the arts agency for New York State, which is a grant-making organization. And a lot of people go, wait, what? What's that? Um, and uh, so it was the first time that I pretty much professionally was in a place that wasn't about arts and where I experienced what the majority, I believe, of this country thinks about arts, which is they don't understand a lot about it, right? So I spent the next seven years realizing that my job was to reframe the role of the arts as something that was critical to the health of people and places. And so when, uh, I, I have to say, Deborah, I think it was you who introduced me to, De to Chris Appleton. Um, and so in my um, former position, I was very excited when this was coming to the fore as something that perhaps I could get piloted in New York State. I left before that was the case, but I'm so happy to be here with this incredible panel of trailblazers who are doing phenomenal work in bringing social prescribing um, to uh, this country. Um, and social prescribing is, sorry, I have my notes in 20 different places. Uh, actually, so social prescribing, it brings together arts and our medical system, in this case, to address issues of mental health um, through arts, artists and arts providers. Um, Chris is going to give a much more detailed or, or short explanation of how it actually works. Um, but before that, uh, I just wanted to do some brief introductions of our panelists, who are all, as I said, incredible, incredibly formidable people in this country in the arts field. And their detailed biographies can be found on the app, so I'm going to give you a super short uh, overview. Um, Chris Appleton at the, is the founder and CEO of Art Pharmacy, a pioneer, pioneering healthcare services company that provides social prescribing services to address healthcare's biggest challenges related to the prevention and treatment of mental health concerns. Some of you may already be familiar with this incredible concept, but for those of you who are not, as I mentioned, Chris will give us an overview in a min minute. Deborah Cullinan, to my right, is a civic and cultural leader with decades of experience leading nonprofits and, ex and advancing equitable change. In 2022, she joined Stanford University as the first full-time vice president for the arts. And as an alumni of Stanford, I couldn't be more happy, happier to share that um, it's really under Deborah's leadership that this is the first time that the arts have held a cabinet level position in the president's administration. At the start of this year, Deborah rolled out an arts prescribing uh, program pilot at, at Stanford, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Michael Bobbitt, a former colleague of mine in the Arts Commissioner field, um, is the Arts Commissioner for Massachusetts, where he has led a number of social prescribing initiatives. Um, must, did you, you didn't initiate Culture RX. You initiated Culture RX, and, which was the first statewide social prescribing pilot in this, in this country. And he's now working together with Art Pharmacy, as is Deborah, to change the, entire, the state's entire mental health arts landscape. Um, before we dive into the conversation, can I just get a sense of who's in the audience? Can we get a sense? Um, but who considers themselves part of the arts field here? Raise of hands. Okay. And who considers themselves part of the healthcare field or other? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start off with Chris. Chris, can you take us through how social prescribing works? Um, and, uh, and also, 
as a as a part of that response, how did you come to this work? And um, why don't we start there? Great. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, social prescribing is a practice through which healthcare providers prescribe non-clinical care to patients to support their health goals. Um, I think it's very important to acknowledge that artists have been healers since the beginning of time. Maybe social prescribing is like a new term or new idea here in the United States. Artists have been providing medicine since the beginning of humankind. Um, also, healthcare providers have been doing community referral forever. So the idea that doctors are referring people to non-clinical care is not novel either. Um, but those two groups, cultural institutions, healthcare institutions, are mostly ill-equipped to work with one another. And so social prescribing is the um, delivery pathway or the ecosystem by which Healthcare providers prescribe participation in things like arts and culture or nature or medicine or food or volunteering or social connection to their patients. Um, at Art Pharmacy, the way that it works, um, and there's many different versions of this, but um, in a healthcare pathway or at, at Art Pharmacy, the way that it works is you go see your primary care provider, you've got a diagnosis or an indication around a mental health disorder, you are experiencing social isolation and loneliness, you um, have a, you have hypertension and your doctor prescribes 12 doses of arts and culture. They call that prescription into art pharmacy via electronic referral, the same way that they call in a prescription to CVS or Walgreens for a pharmaceutical. You then show up to art pharmacy. The patient shows up to art pharmacy, just like they show up to CVS. They get their prescription for art and culture filled um, there's a technology in our model. There's a, a technology component to that. And then they go participate at the local theater, museum, or dance studio, or community arts center, or um, cultural center, whatever it may be. Um, and then we um, bill your insurance company for it or bill some other third-party payer for it. Did you all hear that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Hear that? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, um, and that's, how, and that's how it works. Um, um, and uh, I guess I came to this work uh, after uh, building and leading nonprofit cross-sector arts and culture organizations for my entire career and um, uh, came into the arts and medicine research field there, as you all probably know. Um, there's uh, four decades of research uh, demonstrating that participation in arts and culture improves people's um, health outcomes. Um, there are centers for arts and medicine and arts and health at Harvard and Duke and Johns Hopkins and UCLA and the University of Florida and Northwestern and, I don't know, probably here at Yale as well, um, all over the globe. Um, and the science is very clear. Participation in the arts can improve health outcomes. But um, it was um, uh, the question for, for us was, why hasn't the U.S. healthcare system truly adopted and integrated the arts into care models and into the delivery of, of healthcare services. Um, and there's, there's a lot, you know, our, our, the system is screwed up. Like there's lots of good reasons why, why these things have not historically worked together, but that is changing. Um, thanks in part to the pioneering work that folks like um, Michael and Deborah um, are doing. And we're just grateful to be working with them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, can you talk about how you came to this work and, um, what you've been able to put on the ground in Massachusetts so far. Yeah, sure. So um, I, as Mara said, I run the State Arts Council in Massachusetts, and um, we, um, we've we been rethinking the role of state arts agencies. Um, our work in Massachusetts, specifically, we do a lot of grants, and those grants aren't changing systems. They're meaningful, they're helpful, but they're not fixing the problem that is that exists and, and they're not creating the thing that makes you need to need grants. And I need to fix that. So we started thinking about all the things we can do and, and what our unique position is as a state agency. We are part of government. We have access to government. We can help to create cultural policy and change the landscape. So prior to me getting there, my um, predecessor and a colleague um, heard about social prescribing um, that was, I don't know if it was pioneered in the UK, but they went to the UK to find out what was happening. Once they got there, 
as you all um, feel it, they got very excited about it. So we brought it back to Massachusetts to pilot it starting in 2020. Yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so literally the week before, um, b before everything shut down, we had a pitch session with the legislature to talk about this program and then COVID. Um, so we piloted it with um, 12 arts organizations and 30 healthcare providers. And literally as Chris has described it, um, healthcare providers were trained in how to use um, arts prescription, because I think social prescription is the umbrella term, and there are different kinds of prescriptions. So arts prescriptions, patients will go to their healthcare provider, get a prescription, then take it to the, um, the arts organization to get the prescription filled. So that pilot um, was great. We, we got some research done um, at um, University of Florida. So there was a field guide out there if you want to know, learn how to do this in your own community. Um, also, Harvard also provided some, some research for us. But some of the numbers, we had um, almost 2,000 prescriptions written. These prescriptions were written for the patient and a guest or the patient and their whole family to go. Um, we were providing the reimbursements. Um, and so the data was great. The response was great. All the um, anecdotal surveys that we did were great. The doctors loved it. They felt like they had another tool. Relationships between doctors and patients started changing. Um, some people go to their doctor and the doctor would say, well, there's nothing wrong with you. And then the patient would go home going, yeah, there is, but you're not fixing it. But now they have this tool. One doctor said he felt like he was prescribing beauty into someone's life. Another doctor said they felt like they were giving out Willy Wonka golden tickets. <laughs> um, so um, about two years ago, I said to the staff, listen, we, this is like the best idea since 911 seatbelts and school lunches. This is innovation and entrepreneurship like I've never heard before. We need to scale this and we can't scale it if we're providing funding for it because that funding is limited. What are the tools we can use to get this funded elsewhere? Uh, and there are many, but I said to them, we need to pitch this to insurance companies. They've already been doing this work. They're reimbursing people for yoga, Reiki, and acupuncture. We've had response, we've had years of white papers and, and articles. The US Surgeon General just went on the record saying that hearts are necessity for physical, mental, and, and um, social isolation. So we sought out to find a consultant that we can work with. Initially, my staff was like, we got to find a nonprofit. I'm like, no, let's find a for-profit, someone that wants to make money off this so this thing can scale. And so luckily, we found this guy in arts pharmacy. So if investors are out there, please talk to Chris after this, because this thing to me is going to be zeitgeist. It's going to change the landscape of arts and culture and how arts and culture can integrate with other sectors. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to make money. It's going to be a gateway to food prescriptions and financial course classes and stuff. All kinds of things will happen from this. I also want to say, even though I run the state arts agency, I'm all, I've, I spent many years um, running theaters. I'm a playwright. And so if there are investors out there, I just had two New York readings for my new musical, Monster Mash, the musical based on the songs by um, Bobby Boris Pickett. So talk to me. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, getting back on point. Okay. Uh, actually, <laughs> Chris's, Chris's bio is really is, is formable and puts all, all of us to shame. I'll say that. Um, so, Deborah, um, talk about um, you know bringing this work to Stanford. Well, how you came to it, what you feel about it, and then also bringing this work to Stanford in a place that I still consider somewhat right techy and sciency. And, and, and really, what was the process in getting buy-in um, to, uh, and especially in bringing the student health provider to the table? Like, and, and like, so what, what did that uh, look like in terms of the administrate on the administration side as well? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, great. I'm glad to be here. Um, and I, I'll start just by saying, as, as Mara mentioned, I'm uh, in this role, first person, full time and dedicated. And as I've said to a few people, and maybe some people more than once, um, I think having these kinds of positions that are reporting directly to the leadership at the university, in my case, the president, and sitting on the senior leadership team in the cabinet, there, there's just, there's, 
you can't say enough about how important that is. It means that I can talk all the time ad nauseum about the role that art can play in all kinds of things. So I just, you know, advocate for that in, in all the places. Um, you know, for me, and I think probably for many of us in this room, I've just been driven throughout my career because I know, I know what art can do. I have personally experienced transformation and I've seen it for others. And because of that, I believe that we have an obligation to make art experiences available and accessible to everyone in ways that are relevant and meaningful in their lives. And also because of that knowledge, that feeling of transformation, I believe that we have an obligation to apply the power of the arts to the collective good whenever possible. So when Stanford called, um, despite the part that I was surprised, um, uh, uh, I thought a lot about what could happen at a place like Stanford, not only for Stanford, for its community, for the Bay Area, but also um, in terms of being able to be a platform and a place that can model things or shift things or contribute to the research and the momentum. When I first got the job, a lot of people would say art should be everywhere. Um, and I think that a lot of people mean by that, we should have a very robust public art program, which we do. Uh, we should have art on the stages, in the classrooms, on the walls, which we do and we absolutely should. And we should integrate it into the systems and structures that make up our daily lives everywhere. And if we can do it at a place like Stanford, then we can do it in other places as well. So that's really what brings me to the work. Um, and so fast forward, you know, I've joined the university somewhere in that pandemic thing. And, uh, um, and we all know that um, many people are struggling with isolation and a sense of anxiety and a feeling that they do not belong. Um, and as Chris and, and everyone has said, uh, we also just know we have enough evidence now that we don't even have to talk about it anymore. We know that art is good for us. Uh, and so my one of the first systems that I had my eye on was our student mental health services system. And I was introduced to Chris maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, and we just started talking about what it would be like to collaborate in order to integrate the arts into our student mental health services. In my case, um, this is about proving the concept. Uh, so for us, it was about... Um, raising some dollars in order to support a pilot program that then we would all understand was so powerful that we could integrate it more thoroughly into our um, insurance system, our staff well-being programs, all of the other kinds of systems on the campus. So, and I'll say something about that in just a quick second, but so Chris already described it really, but just to, to say a few more words about it, um, this is aimed at students. Any student is eligible postdoc, graduate students, undergraduate students, they can self-refer or they are referred through a network of community partners. Uh, Vaden, our mental health services, their well-being outreach workers are able to make these referrals. We wanted to get more community partners across the campus, more units on campus, because we wanted to reach as many students as we could, especially those students that might not engage with mental health staff. And so we thought we'd have maybe a half dozen community referral partners. And to Michael's point, we have 46 as of last I heard. Um, another example of how many people in this case who are engaging with students who want to be able to offer something that is non-clinical, non-pharmaceutical, and it brings them a sense of joy as well. So this is like a win-win for everyone. Uh, and that number is growing rapidly. So Stanford students are, they can refer, they get referred, they're written a prescription. Uh, art Pharmacy has built an absolutely spectacular database of every single arts activity that we're aware of on campus. Uh, art Pharmacy also hired another absolutely spectacular person uh, to be our care navigator. Um, so the student is referred. Our care navigator, care navigator then engages with the student to understand them a little bit better, find out what they would like. Um, do they like opera? Do they want to do something that's more hands-on? Do they want to go to the museum? What are their barriers? 
Um, it won't be surprising. Their barriers are usually their schedules. Um, but also to your point as well, uh, many of them we found didn't want to go to things alone. And so our job was to just move all of that out of the way. We take care of the ticket. The care navigator does all of the work. And this is a legitimate situation. You have nine doses and we've, we've enabled a, an opportunity for you to bring a friend, these kinds of things. Um, we started it in winter quarter. We have over 100 prescriptions now out and about, which for us was pretty remarkable. Um, we thought it would take a while to get an uptick. Uh, and we're, I think we're around 94% fulfillment at this point. Um, uh, Art Pharmacy uses WHO's well-being um, index. So we benchmark at the beginning and then we check in throughout and we're seeing about 20% improvement. So for us, this is the beginning and we want to prove a concept so that then we can integrate it not only into the system of supporting our students, but also for us to be able to do that kind of campus-wide. And then probably most importantly, it's to take our knowledge and our resources and to be able to apply that external to Stanford, working with art pharmacy, maybe in a community college system, maybe across the state of California, but to be able to really, really be part of the momentum and add what we can do to something that can change uh, the policy permanently. That's great. And can you just talk about um, bringing your proof of concept to campus and how, so did you have fun, like how difficult it was for you to access the campus funds for this, were there, were there many layers of bureaucracy or was it actually, was there buy-in from the beginning? Yeah, yeah, I mean, are there many layers of bureaucracy at Stanford? That could be a panel discussion. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that one there. Um, but, Specifically, but I, this is I think I mentioned we met less than two years ago and we're already two quarters in. So. We made this happen, I think, very quickly in the university time. Uh, I had zero challenge at all getting buy-in from the president, the provost, senior staff. Um, I think what's also interesting is, um, you know, at places like Stanford, we have a museum, part of my portfolio. We have, you know, a large collecting institution. We have a very large performing arts organization, et cetera. And they're the ones that are typically, they have an advisory council, they have all kinds of donors, right? And then we have all of these other activities on campus that are arts-based that are usually underfunded, have not been recognized for the impact that they have. And so what has been surprising and interesting to me about this is many of our donors want to fund this. And so while we're trying to disrupt systems, and as Chris will tell you, um, healthcare gets paid for in many different ways. One of the systems that I think we're disrupting is the kind of do traditional donor system on a campus and what they will arts fund. And I think that's really exciting, opening people up to the whole idea that you can fund things like this that are really about health and well-being in our communities. <coughs> just uh, I can pick up, up, yeah, can I yeah. just pick up on one thing that you mentioned about sort of the one of the barriers for Stanford students is not wanting to go alone, or um, in particular uh, um, around uh, schedules, right? So, so largely, what these social prescribing schemes do is they remove barriers to for people to be able to participate in the things that are already available to them. And those barriers are things like the need to not go alone or to take a family or to, uh, you need transportation assistance or you need permission to prioritize your mental health um, or you aren't aware of the resources that are available in your community. And so when we work with Medicaid and Medicare plans, the, the, the barriers look different than they do at Stanford. It's people literally don't have transportation to get to the thing that is so good for their health. And so you construct a model where the health plan is paying for the transportation assistance so that people can go and participate in these sorts of activities. So, I, yeah, I just think... Did, did you all hear that? Medicare and Medicaid will be covering in certain places, <laughs> covering this cost. So I, just, to, just to add to that, um, the... Challenges. So in Massachusetts, we, we now have over 400 arts organizations in network, which is very exciting. Once, once we launch this bigger scaled up version, um, which is great because that's going to also reduce some of the barriers of participation. I do want to say to those arts organizations out there, you don't really have to do anything differently. You just do what you do. Not only is this going to be a revenue stream for you all that's different than 
grants and ticket sales, but it's also going to be an audience development tool for you all as well. I think the current challenge is going to be that, and since Kalita Jones called us all out this morning, I'm going to, I'm going to add to that. This sector self-segregates a lot. We also aren't as organized when it comes to comparing us to other sectors like health and tech and the gun lobby who are so much better at policy advocacy than we are. And so it's not a surprise, as Chris said earlier, that we haven't discovered these tools that already exist that can bridge the gap between arts and mental health because we self-segregate and we're not organized. So one of the challenges going to be in Massachusetts is that, so let me just do a survey of hands. How many of you are all in the arts? Keep your hands up if you think arts are good for health care. How many of y'all have been to some sort of health care convening in the last year? You know, I would just so, so we have a product, but we're not showing up in the places where we can sell the product. But, yeah, but I would also add to that, right, which is uh, we self-segregate, but we're also segregated, right, in the, in the framework of the, I would just say the American people, for, for better or yeah. worse. So, so I, the point is the arts organizations are going to have to show up in different spaces to sell this product. You're going to have to talk to your doctors, your health care providers, your mental health providers, your school counselors to get the word out that this is a tool for them to use and it's going to benefit you all. Right. Um, great. So here's a, here's a, uh, this was in something I think, Deborah, that I read at Stanford. So the WHO, the World Health Organization's constitution in 1946, defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. We are now facing probably one of the country's greatest mental health crises, right? Um, I just read an article that was in the journal two days ago about the current state of our work, uh, of our hybrid work, is now actually furthering the loneliness factor in our lives, and which is also part of mental health, right? And the correlation between mental with uh, loneliness and mental health, and I think, Chris, you have some really interesting facts to uh, data to share on that, uh, which is people who have chronic disease and coupled with loneliness and what that equals. And I was just downstairs in the, um, the psychedelic forum, and they were talking about this exact same data. Um, so my question is, why... With, with decades of experience of social prescribing in Canada and U.S., why has it taken, uh, sorry, Canada and U.K., why has it taken so long to get here? Um, is it because we self-segregate? Um, but also, is it, is it also because we're, as the health system has been uh, late to the late to start to address the extent to which mental health is such a critical component of physical health? Anyone can take that up. I think both, and I think we're also a very conservative sector. Not politically, but when it comes to business models and changing our models, we know some of, we know most of our models are broken, but yet we still do things like subscriptions. Racist <laughs> racist policies. I mean it's it's so so I think that I think it's all those things you just mentioned. I think it's also, you know, in the UK with a with a single payer model you know, the, the, your health insurer in the national health system in the UK when you're five years old is your same health insurer when you're 75 years old. So that insurer is incentivized to pay for upstream preventative care because if they don't, it's going to cost them money down the road. But today I get my health insurance through my wife at Blue Cross Blue Shield, but tomorrow she's going to get a new job at you know, and it's going to be United Healthcare. And why does Blue Cross want to pay for United Savings today, right? So it's just a it's just a different it's just a different model. Um, why the U.S. Uh, doesn't pay for historically has not invested in this kind of preventative care. Uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is, is starting to drive towards some change around this and think about whole person care and, and invest more in the biopsychosocial model. Yeah, I also think. I also think that, um, you know, part of my point earlier in just talking a little bit about the kind of both and way I think about um, the arts, uh, for me, that's also something that we do to ourselves. We still sit in a binary quite often. I, I do have uh, 
conversations at Stanford where people worry that I might be instrumentalizing, which I just could, you know, never hear again. And I would be, I would be healthier. But, um, but I, I also think we should just embrace all that art can do. Just completely embrace that. And sometimes be really good with instrumentalizing it if it is going to help. And, and our fear of that, our need for something other than that, I think is another challenge um, that we have to continue to work on. I remember, I remember going to um, uh, it's NASA, which is not space, but actually the National Association of State Arts Agencies convening that uh, I used to attend annually. And I went to a, um, a f uh, talk. I don't know if you were there too, Michael. But I went to talk about um, just this, the words arts. I mean, it was actually a talk about communications and how we t communicate about arts, right, in, in all of its forms. And so... Um, and I remember this is the beginning of my time at um, at the state. You know, when I was encountering people who worked in tourism, and they would say like, "Arts? What's that?" And I'd say, I'd say "Well, it's the thing that pays your uh, that that drives your economies." But anyway, um, uh, so um, but the thing is that um, uh, what they what the sort of conclusion of this of this talk was about the fact that. Um, if you use the word creativity, everyone thinks it's about them. They see dollar signs. They see, oh, it's my kids are creative. I do things that are creative. And creative creativity is a word that everyone can understand. It's a like a big door word. And if you use the word art, it's sort of a trigger word. It's a small door word. And so, and that was like my second year of this job. And I walked out and I was like, okay, got it. Okay, got it. Um, and yeah, and we're still wrestling with this, right? We're oh, still yeah, yeah. Wrestling I think our this. messaging around why we're vital is, is very, very, very dated. Um, it's the same thing for me when people talk to me about sports ball. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't get it. I have no idea. What I don't even know what a Celtic is, and I am in Boston. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but when they talk to me about teamwork, I'm like, oh, I get that. I get that. I get teamwork. So same thing with creativity and arts. Because um, some people think arts is weird, right? And so yeah, I do. So, but you know, I'm so excited about this work because it is a way to reframe the role of the arts as something critical, but also it's, it's solving for many problems, if you are, or challenges. It's solving uh, our health, our, our soaring health care costs, right? It's, talk, it's speaking to that. It's speaking, obviously, to the patients who are going to greatly benefit from this, um, who have mental challenges. But it also, I mean, to your point, which is something that I'm sort of dreaming about, especially after COVID, which is also speaking to how do we create consistent revenue streams for artists and for arts organizations, right? And, as, and now they are part of a system as to mean something that, oh, you're going to theater night? That's lovely, right? Um, and uh, so... That's super exciting. And I was wondering, Chris, if you could share some of the data that you shared with me about um, the, uh, you know, the cost to the healthcare system or to insure of someone who has chronic disease coupled with depression or loneliness. We all know, and I mean, it's probably pretty obvious that folks that, um, so chronic diseases are, you know, the diabetes, hypertension, these are the most expensive things that, you know, health plans pay for. Um, and people are less likely to adhere to a, their hypertension treatment or their diabetes treatment. If they have a mental health disorder, they're less likely to adhere to that. If they're social isolated or lonely, people um, are healthier and less burdensome to the system if they have a stronger relationship with their primary care provider and don't go seek out care only in the emergency department. And people are more likely to seek care in the emergency department when they have a um, mental health crisis. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think like the, to me, the best analog for, for what the social prescribing, you know, and arts prescriptions can be is, um, is this, uh, is, is silver sneakers. Um, if, uh, raise your hand if you were unaware that your health outcomes were connected to your physical activity level. It's like a very silly thing to say in 2024, right? We all know that. But 30 years ago, that wasn't true, right? 30 years ago, a company emerges, Silver Sneakers, and they have this bright idea that they're going to get older adults engaged in physical activity at their local YMCA or senior center or Zumba class, um, and that they might prevent overutilization of healthcare services, improve people's health. Seven years later, 
They go to Medicare and they say, look, we're saving you a gazillion dollars. And now everyone on a Medicare plan in the United States has access to a Silver Sneakers membership or some competitor of Silver Sneakers that now emerges. And it's just a national network of fitness programs for older adults paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. So our cultural institutions, our museums, our community arts centers, our dance studios, our theaters, are those YMCAs and Zumba classes and, and senior centers, right? That, that in a generation, folks like us will be sitting in a room saying, remember when we didn't know that our health outcomes were connected to our engagement with art, culture, creativity, and connection to others, right? And it'll be a silly thing to say. And the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government, U.S. taxpayer, will be paying through healthcare dollars for our access to arts, culture, and creativity because it improves health, reduces the burden on the system. Right. I think, too, I just want to add, um, yes, I want to be in that future. Um, but also, a lot of what we're focusing on, I, not entirely, but is, is around mental health. Uh, but there is plenty of evidence about the role that art plays around many chronic conditions, many physical challenges. And there's also a lot of evidence about what happens when people experience art and creativity that is relevant and meaningful to them early and often. So way upstream instead of downstream. And that's a another reason why we have to shift the system because we're, it's just expensive. If, if nothing else matters to us, it costs too much to be reactive. We should really be proactive and we have the evidence. So we need to be able to integrate this kind of stuff so that it's just a part of the way we think about your whole health. Yeah, I, I, quickly, similar to this, uh, and I know Chris has a product too, but we're now talking to major employers about either adding an arts benefit as a retention tool or into their employee packet or just expanding their wellness packet to include arts and culture. It, one, it's, it's a retention tool. Two, um, creativity by the World Economic Forum is now the top skill needed by the workforce. And then three, it's going to help everyone feel better about working. So, um, can you, um, Chris? So I'm going to push you a little bit more on this because I, uh, you shared these data with me. But um, how many people in this country have diabetes? And if they have diabetes plus loneliness or plus depression, I believe you, t you shared that it costs twice as that person would cost. It's it's twice as much. I don't I don't know how many people. I mean, I think diabetes is the fourth or fifth um, most prevalent. Um, disease amongst people in the United States, but people, I mean, uh, you know, somebody from United Healthcare told me this just a couple of weeks ago, our members that are, have diabetes and are lonely um, are twice as expensive as our members that have diabetes and are not lonely. Um, that's a, that is a problem for United Healthcare and the arts can help solve that problem for United Healthcare, not I do, to mention I, the person who is lonely. I do want to just, I have to jump in. I am the mother of a type one diabetic who suffers from severe anxiety and depression. And I don't want to think of him as a problem. Um, I think we have to find a way, especially to not stigmatize people as we're moving through this work. I think it's really important. Yeah. No, and thank you, Deborah. Um, but also to your point, Deborah, I mean, we know, I mean, Mark Moore's dance company, they have a phenomenal um, a program for Parkinson's, right? It is decades old. It is now internationally accessible and it, it works. Right, and back to your point about what we know about arts. I mean, arts, and um, we know that people. I mean, there's instances of people in you know my net, my world um, who've been uh, you know were dealing with cancer for a very long time. And when you uh, add the arts and regular arts engagement to that um, to that scenario, they are managing their cancer way better and the outcomes are better. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, but we, the thing is that our therapy has been around for a long time, right? And we know that it works for various physical illnesses and situations. And, um, but I, what's fascinating to me about this work is that we're now, it's now becoming, becoming systematized and more, I would hope to say mainstream. And I hope that 30 years from now, we are really talking about what you said, which is now become, it's now thought of what we really originally thought of for, uh, for physical um, fitness, right? That like, should be a regular part of our lives. This should be a regular part of our lives. And then we'll start to look at 
um, the whole, you know, back to um, how we define health. Um, maybe we'll get back to the 1946 definition of it <laughs> um, by the World Health Organization. Um, so, uh, Deborah, I have a question. I you, you mentioned that um, you. It sounds like the take up by the students exceeded your expectations. Um, was that because of the kind of techy, sciencey nature of the student body, or like what were what were your thoughts? Yeah. I, uh, it wasn't. I mean, I, you know, my experience at Stanford, and I'm sure this is true at plenty of places that um, that are obsessed with innovation and technology, um, is that the campus is an extremely creative community and that many, many, many of our students are artists, whether they're going to bravely declare an arts major or not. Um, and so that wasn't it. It was their schedules and the fact that they are so overprogrammed. Um, and it, it also, I think, in the case of, the, you know, this population's age population, I, you know, they don't always want to be told what to do. Um, and so really working with the, the really skillful team at Art Pharmacy helps us to help the students understand how exciting and, and you know, what the opportunity really is for them. Um, so, yeah, no, Great. it's more about overprogrammed. Great. Okay. Love to hear that. Um, can you, can Deborah and Michael, can you talk about, uh, and Chris, can you talk about when you started developing the collaboration or the partnership with Art Pharmacy? What, what pieces were actually developed collaboratively and, or were there? Yeah. I mean, for us, we had lots of data and we had a beta test. The, the biggest idea was to converting my staff to thinking about our job in this now because our pharmacy is there doing all the, Chris calls it the guts, um, doing all the work between the prescription and then the fulfillment of the prescription. Our job changed from managing a program to enrolling every single arts organization, introducing this to every healthcare provider from going to like the Secretary of Health and Human Services and also introducing Chris to as many insurance companies and payers as we could. So that's kind of what we're doing now. The staff is not managing a program. In fact, we paused the grant program because we know that we're going to launch this. It's going to be much bigger. So that, that's the, that was the big learning curve for us. I, I think so. And, um, you know, Michael and Mass Cultural Council have been these incredible partners. We're headquartered in Atlanta and work in Georgia, California, Massachusetts right now. And um, um, Michael and Mass Cultural Council have been these amazing partners because as a state agency, as a funder, they have access to people um, and organizations, government leaders, civic leaders, corporate leaders that um, you know would be challenging for us to get access to from, you know, little old Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and like Michael is, as those of you that know him, the most tireless, um, leader in this, like there's rarely a day pa that passes that I don't get an introduction to a healthcare executive, um, or a healthcare advocacy leader from, from Michael, um, which has opened incredible doors for us. And then what we're good at is translating this model for, those stakeholders, um, and we'll we'll announce next week two dual eligible Medicaid Medicare plans and a, one of the largest integrated health systems in the country as partners in Massachusetts um, to address isolation, loneliness, and hypertension. I would just add to that. In addition to the way I described earlier, I think we both did a little bit how we're collaborating. One of the things that has been so exciting to me about this work is that. The people who are pioneering and working on this across the country are all in it together. This is not, this is about winning. It's about moving the dial. It's about changing policy. It's about doing something permanent. I will introduce Chris Appleton to anyone in the state of California that I can, uh, because I see, I know what my role is. My role is to help show how this can be done in a place like Stanford, but we're all sort of, it's, 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 I think it's just really exciting. To feel that when you talked earlier about this kind of like we're a little splintered, not in this, not in this moment. The pie is so big, yeah. like it's so big, um, and the arts has like this amount of the pie right now. So like we don't need to compete because the pie is so big. So um, just uh, ting off of this because something that you said earlier about um, in the UK, in Canada, there's only basically one health system, right? And um, and they're very invested from you know from early stage because they're going to have 
that same patient at the age of 75. So I'm just curious, based on what you just said, and um, Deborah and Chris, what are you experiencing about the insurers who are coming into this right now? Are they talking to each other? Are they wanting to learn from each other? Uh, what's the, yeah, can you talk about that? It's a great question, Michael. I haven't shared this with you, but we were um, on a call this morning with the PR team for um, one of our health system partners in Massachusetts, who we are planning a joint press conference with here in a week. And they don't want to show up to the same press conference with the big health plan that um, is also going to um, be a part of this announcement. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd say that healthcare is a pretty competitive environment. <laughs> and, and, and I've been pitting them against each other. Like, I've been reaching out. I've been like, you know, such and such is coming on board. If you don't come on board in this first announcement, you're going to be like, wham, wham, when yours is announced. So, um, so yeah, they're super competitive. But this is not at the, to be really clear, like this is not at the, the individual level, individual providers, healthcare providers, leaders, like, every, you know, it is, a, it is a big team effort and everyone is really collaborative. It only is when it gets into the sort of business of it. Yeah. Okay. And, and what about the student health service at Stanford? Were they, did they, were they excited to be part of the announcement? They part of this project? Where, like, you know, I, I think they want, they wanted to, they wanted to have it be more of a network of, of referring partners, which I think, I think we're really fortunate that that's what we've developed. But yeah, people are, like I said, very enthusiastic, raising their hands. And we also have integrated it in, to, into our staff wellbeing program and um, doing all of those kinds of things as well. It's really good. The, the other challenge I would say when I when I speak from a ignorant place because Chris has all the data and all the information about health services, um, they want to know ROI and return on investment. They want hard data, and so much of this is about anecdotal data. And so getting them to understand that the qualitative data is just as valuable as the quantitative data is going to be part of what I think. We're going to have to work on to, to scale this the way I think it, it can and will scale. Um, but right now, they're asking a lot, a lot of numbers that isn't maybe there, don't exist. Isn't there long, is there any longitudinal data from the other there countries? Is. There's, there's a longitudinal study, Dr. Daisy Fancourt at University College London. Um, uh, I think uh, 8,500 participants um, shows that sustained ongoing, I mean, unsurprisingly, right, that sustained ongoing engagement, arts and culture, reduces isolation and loneliness, boosts belonging and well-being, improves healthcare outcomes. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of data out there. I, I think that the qualitative, the, the, the stories, the qualitative data are helpful for getting um, pilots and initial partnerships and pulling in certain people, but to really get adoption, to really get adoption, it, it's, uh, it's about either increasing revenue for health systems or reducing cost of total cost of care for health plans. Um, I mean, you have to, you have to solve for both the clinical outcome and an economic outcome. Um, and so my, you know, which is what we measure with our, with our, uh, healthcare partners, um, uh, both of those. My recommendation to anyone who, you know, would perhaps want to want to pursue this is that get the health plan at the table on day zero. They only believe their data. They don't believe your data. And so even if you have to give it to the health plan for free, get them at the table on day zero um, in order to um, uh, measure the things that matter to them. And you'll be able to you'll be able to track um, because you're going to get this data uh, reduction in doctor visits after people have gone fulfilled their prescriptions and things like that. So that, so we're going to be able to show them that this is actually working. Yeah, Deborah. Well, I I think Chris loves it when I do this, but uh, the, you know the world where we're all come back together for a reunion and. You know, we know we we just can't believe that we ever thought that art and creativity and, and experiences didn't. I want that world to also be a world where we understand not a return on investment, but ripples of return, and where the financial return is not the only return that matters. So as we disrupt broken systems, we also have to have our eyes on the prize. What should it be? If we could imagine it anew, it should be a healthcare system where we value all of these other inputs, which I, I think is happening um, quite a bit because the evidence is uh, quite rounded. 
but it, it, you know, it, 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 we're in that moment where we're, we're transacting because it's still so highly financially transactional, but we have to be striving for a system that really values all those other things. Right. But, and right. Fantastic. The thing is, it seems like to get the insurers, the, the businesses at the table, it's going to, you're going to start with the financial and then you're going to have to write, talk about and continue. Right. Y- yes. We're going to, because they're going to realize all things that are harder to prove now right. Right. that, that it, it's just harder to it. Like Chris says in their, in the way that any financial institution or stru- structure is going to be measuring it, we haven't yet transformed what those measurements look like. And those measurements should include like, you know, social outcomes and all kinds of other things that we know to be of extreme value and that will actually improve our health outcomes and be much less expensive in the long run. I think there are a lot of pain points that, that the health systems and health plans uh, have that arts prescriptions or the arts can help solve. Certainly there is the financial challenge that we're, we're talking about, but uh, Medicaid and Medicare plans are particularly, you know, highly, highly regulated. They have to meet, I mean, this is really what we started with at Art Pharmacy, which was the health plan, the Medicaid plan, Medicaid, you know, federal program for people that are economically disadvantaged that is administered at the state level. Most states don't want to run their own Medicaid plan. So they contract with private companies like Kaiser Permanente or Blue Cross Blue Shield or Humana or United Healthcare to administer the Medicaid plan for them. Well, then they enter into this like highly regulated relationship and the health plan is required to meet time to care requirements. So if somebody raises their hand and says, hey, I've got a mental health concern, I need to see a provider and that Medicaid plan can't provide access to a behavioral health provider in 28 days, that's a ding, right? Um, Well, in the mental health crisis, there's more and more demand. Um, The supply side challenge is significant for traditional behavioral health interventions. Well, the arts are just like sitting there on the shelf, just ready. There's like, tell me a museum or a theater or a cultural institution that isn't ready to provide more access. Right, they're just ready, and so they're they're in addition to the financial ones. Um, there there are other uh, sort of regulatory pain points that. The That's great, uh, so exciting. Um, we're going to open up to you guys. Um, if there are questions in the audience. Uh, have to. We have a few more minutes. Um, why don't we start over, over? Does anyone have a mic? Oh, I think there's going to be roving mics. Okay, no, our mics. Okay, roving. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jody Ann, and I have a question. I, I guess this is mostly directed to Michael and Chris, but Deborah, feel free to chime in. Uh, so, per Chris, I heard you say that it's currently you're based in Atlanta, and this is pre, it's currently being um, done in also California and Massachusetts. So, my question here is for um, the entire country. Um, is there a plan moving forward where all Medicare um, members would have the opportunity to have art pharmacy? And then the second question that I have on top of that is the arts, it has the capacity um, to build community, right? And one of the things that, Michael, you touched on a little bit is there's, it's a segregated drive when it comes to moving policies forward for art pharmacy. So understanding how the arts build community, why not work with individuals like myself um, who are small entrepreneurs within the community to drive the initiative and then we on the community basis can build that community for you that when you sit before policymakers, you can say, hey, look at what the impact of this is doing within various communities throughout the U.S. So not just that it is helping you to save money, which Michael tapped on, but it's building a community that is changing the narrative of our country. So how my, the second full question that I have there is how do we initiate that bridge between you who have these policies already in place along with small community businesses like myself and non for profits and for profits alike to create a bridge to drive the policy forward. Uh, 
Well, to, to the, the scaling of Art Pharmacy, every investor in here is going to invest in Art Pharmacy so he can franchise, right? So he can scale up. So that, that will answer that. I mean, who knows what Chris has planned, but I hope that will happen. Um, to your second point, and this goes a little bit back to the couple of conversations we had earlier today. Um, so in order for me to get the community to back me up when it comes to policy changing, the arts community has to show up at the public square. And that is a challenge. One, you're slammed. You're underfunded. You're slammed. So going to advocate is it may not be a priority. I also think um, to some of the conversations we've had earlier that anyone getting a degree in arts should have base level business training and base level civics training because we are, the art sector is losing out on so much funding and government contracts because we do not put pressure on our leaders to focus on us. And the art sector tends to, as I mentioned, we're very conservative, so we don't change our behavior. We expect everyone to change their behavior. So we 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 have to show up at the public square, I, and schools have to change their curriculum. I'm sorry, I, I'm surprised, and I'm saying this, and I'm probably going to lose my job, but I'm surprised that alum of schools haven't got together and formed a class action suit against their universities for not giving them basic business and civics training. Um, it, it needs to happen. Um, and so that's what's going to have to happen. I mean, we're going to have to change our behavior and show up at the public square so that when I go in front of a legislator, there are thousands of artists behind me, and that doesn't happen. But it will. Okay. I think uh, I'd like to share just one. I, yeah, I think it's uh, so, so important that there are many different versions. I mean, Michael said, Art Pharmacy, we're trying to scale nationally. Um, you know, we got a commitment from a partner two weeks ago to actually come here to Connecticut, um, which we'll start working on this fall. Um, but the, it is so important that there are different versions of this model. There's no silver bullet. There is no singular way of doing this. Um, it must be a coalition effort. Um, and we, we partner with grassroots community organizations and large cultural institutions and contract with at, individual teaching artists and partner them with libraries and community centers that need programming. I mean, all of that is, is a part of it. So I'd love to learn more about what you do and if there's ways we can support your work. Great. Thank you. Next question. How about let's go to the other side of the room over here. Oh, okay. You have someone there. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So this, I don't know if this is going to be a clear question, but what was coming up for me is, you know, we're in a liberal environment. We're on the East Coast. Um, I'm just picturing, you know, my uncle from Texas showing up to the doctor and being like, you want me to take an acting class? What? You know, like, how do you get art is healing, art is medicine in a, in a culture of, and I don't know if this is the right word, but you guys will get it, toxic masculinity that looks at creativity as feminine. And that's not for me. You know, like, how do you, how do you get that message across and like convince not, I mean, you can, can you convince them? Right. And obviously exposure is important, but that's what was coming up for me is there are a lot of States between Massachusetts and California that I can't imagine would buy into <laughs> from there. Um, so that's my question. Well, doctors prescribe lots of things. They, they give you a prescription for medicine, but also they say like, you got to eat better. Here's a health plan. You got to exercise. Here's an exercise plan. So this is another tool they can use. And the great thing about Chris's system is that the patient then will talk to a care navigator who will say, who are you? What are your demographics? What kind of creativity might you be interested in engaging in? And so they may want to take a pottery class because they saw the movie Ghost. <laughs> and they want to do that thing with their wife or partner. At the, so it's there, so it, it will be tailored to each individual, each individual. Or, so. or maybe they want to go on a, a walking uh, architecture tour or um, to some cultural experience that uh, isn't... Uh, thought of as necessarily a fine art experience. I mean, we, we you know, we have to think broadly um, as a, a prior panel was talking about of what we mean by arts, culture, and, and creativity. I wanted it to cover my Beyonce tickets and <laughs> okay, um, she cost me a lot. And I spent all that money on
Okay. okay, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, thank you so much, Michael. Okay. Uh, <laughs> has to be what resonates with you, right? Okay. Okay, go ahead. I'll try, to, I'll try to ask quickly. I wanted to ask about how race factors into this, because we, we know that there's all kind of racism in healthcare. And then we know that our arts organizations are not always the most welcoming or inclusive places. And so, especially, Deborah, I'm wondering about students of color on Stanford's campus. Is this helping solve that? Or is it sort of like one racist system plus a second racist system redoubling the problem? Yeah, it's such an important, such an important question. And I think it's another reason why we, we are really pleased that we have right now 46 and growing uh, community referral partners. Um, and the point of that was to meet people where they are. And the point of building a database that is, is in really inclusive in terms of what all of the opportunities are is to be able to provide things that are meaningful and relevant to people. So Institute for Diversity in the Arts, um, the Black House, like these are athletics, like these are all community referral partners. And it, it's, I think it's extremely important. And it, it goes to the other, the other point, it, you know, it, it's, this is about finding what people would like to do and what would resonate with them. Yeah, that, that's one of the, the two things. One is that Mass Cultural Council is now trying to onboard as many multicultural arts organizations into the network as possible. And then two, the great thing about the Care Navigator is they will talk to the patient about their demographics because maybe a Latino person wants to go to a salsa class. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways we're dealing with, with race. Um, Thank you guys so much. We're at time. I know this conversation can continue for quite a while, but um, I wanted, can you join me in thanking so much our panelists? <laughs> <laughs>